Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Pia Callison about metacognitive therapy, worrying, and rumination. Clearer Thinking listeners may also enjoy the Jolly Swagman podcast, which we're doing a cross-promotion with. Despite its mysterious Australian title, the show features mostly British and American guests. Host Joe Walker is a startup operator by day, but recently received an Emergent Ventures grant for his podcast, which is known for deeply researched interviews with scientists, founders, economists, and public intellectuals. For example, in his interview with Daniel Kahneman, they explore whether pairs are the optimal creative unit, and in his interview with Catalin Carico, they discuss how she would reform bioscience funding. To listen or subscribe, search the Jolly Swagman in your podcast app or go to thejspod.com. Pia, welcome. Thank you. So many people in their lives will experience mental health disorders, whether it's anxiety or depression. And even if they don't experience them themselves, they're very likely to have friends or family members or other loved ones who experience them. So I think it's a really relevant and important question of how do we best treat mental health challenges? And I know that you have a particular perspective on this question that I'm really interested to dig into. And in particular, I know that you're a proponent of metacognitive therapy. So why don't we start with what is metacognitive therapy? Well, metacognitive therapy is actually a new uh, paradigm in psychology um, where we can we understand and treat depression and anxiety in the in a quite new way. Um, norm, when we're used to uh, thinking that, that thoughts are very important and you have to think positive and so on to, to have a happy life and to not be depressed. But really, thoughts do not matter. And what metacognitive therapy teaches us is that it's not the thoughts themselves. You can have a very pessimistic mind. You don't need to be depressed, even though you think negative about yourself or the world. It's what you do with the negative thoughts that matters. So it's your metacognitive beliefs about, uh, you know, can I leave the thought alone if it's very negative? Do I have to work on the thought? And if you think that, then you do. You spend maybe ten hours a day ruminating, um, worrying, and so on. And it's, it's this prolonged thinking that is the cause uh, of mental health issues like anxiety and depression. So mental health therapy helps us reduce the time. So, so yeah, it's ten hours. We go from ten hours to half an hour of worrying and rumination and so on, and that uh, overcomes the depression and the anxiety. Well not our economy or the, or the real problems in the world, but the mental issues, the mental health issues. So let me make sure I understand that. So you could have two people, let's call them Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob could both have a whole bunch of negative thoughts, but Alice might have a certain view on her own negative thoughts that makes, the, makes it much worse for herself, where Bob maybe has a different perspective on the negative thoughts. So yeah, could you elaborate a bit on what is the different perspective that they might have? Well, the one person would, would think it's normal to have negative thoughts. I don't need to do anything with them. And they, he also believes that he can actually leave them alone. So we call it the uncontrollability belief. Is it possible to have a negative thought or many negative thoughts and not chew on them? We use metaphors like fish hook. Can you have 10 fish hooks and you don't need to chew on the fish hooks? You know, like, or can you not jump on the train on the train station, even though it's there? So that's like the negative thought. The negative thought is like the train on the train st- station. You don't need to jump on it. And so one person, Bob, might believe he can leave the thought alone, where the, as the other person with the same thought, he doesn't believe it's possible to leave this thought alone. And he might also believe you need to work on this thought. It's a real problem. I have a very bad boss or I don't have a good economy or my, my girlfriend is unfaithful or whatever. So I need to spend 10 hours working out what to do. So he has these positive beliefs about uh, worrying and rumination will help me solve my problems. Whereas Bob thinks, no, it won't. You know, I don't think 10 hours of <laughs> rumination will solve my problem. And I can also con- I can control. I don't, don't need to uh, spend 10 hours uh, working on my problem. I can leave them alone. So it's the uncontrollability belief and the uh, usefulness belief, the positive belief about the usefulness of this chewing process that um, is the difference. So Bob will get depressed because he thinks he can. he's uh, chewing 10 hours a day on his thoughts whereas the other person doesn't get depressed because he can leave the thought alone, even though they have the same negative thoughts and they have the same problems in life. So now you talk about these two beliefs. One is this uncontrollability belief that like you can't control your thoughts. And then this other belief about the thoughts being useful, like rumination or worry being useful. From your point of perspective, is it sufficient to just sort of 
lose those beliefs? Like if someone stops believing in uncontrollability and they stop believing those thoughts are useful, then will they just worry a lot less automatically? Or are there other things that have to happen in that process? Well, no, that's the main part. That's really what we use, what we spend time on in metacognitive therapy. So we keep the dialogue on the meta level. We don't actually go into the content level of, you know, do you think is, is your interpretation right or wrong? Or would you think more positive? We don't go into the content level. We stay on this meta level. How much time do you spend? Is it possible to not spend so much time? And so it will take like five to 12 sessions to overcome depression because we don't problem solve or, you know, go into the content. And that, and that really is just what, it, what we need to work on. And, and then people will go from 10 hours to half an hour. Then if you have generalized anxiety, then you also have the worry about the worry. So we also work on type two worry, we call it. So you have the normal worry and you don't believe it's, it's controllable if you have generalized anxiety disorder. But you also worry about your worry because you think uh, the worry is causing you um, maybe cancer or heart attack or it's dangerous to, over, to worry a lot because it stresses your body and so on. So you also have this danger belief about worry, worrying being dangerous. So we also work on that belief. So we have the uncontrollability belief, the danger belief about worry, and also the usefulness belief. But these are basically the only beliefs we work on in metacognitive therapy, and that overcomes 80, 90% of mental Ill health issues. It's really interesting to me to contrast this with other systems. So maybe you could tell the listeners a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of the most common paradigms in treating anxiety and depression and then contrast it with, with your approach? Well, it's a huge difference. It's actually like day and night. And I've, I know this because I've done cognitive therapy for the first 10 years of my career as a psychologist. So uh, I've, I've done a lot of CBT. And it's, I mean, there, there, are, there are hardly any similarities. It's, uh, I mean, the, the, the theory is completely different. Like in, in CBT, thoughts are important. And what you think about yourself and the world will actually cause the depression from a CBT view. So if you have negative beliefs about being a failure, then you will more likely become depressed. So they have a diff. I mean, in CBT, it's your negative thinking that's the problem. And also you need to expose yourself. If you're anxious about something, you need to habituate to what you're anxious for. So it's a lot of work because you need to restructure your thoughts and spend a lot of time on your thoughts, restructuring them and so on, and expose yourself to, to anxiety-provoking things and so on. So it's, it's quite um, hard work. Whereas in metacognitive therapy, the, the thoughts don't matter. The content doesn't matter. So you can, you can believe you are a failure. If you don't do anything with that thought, if you leave the thought alone, it will self-regulate. So one day you'll think you're a failure. If you leave it alone, the next day you'll think, I'm a perfect person or I'm a good person. You know, It will self-regulate your view about, on yourself and your negative thoughts will become positive if you leave them alone, like a weather system nearly. You know, like a weather system. So one day it's sunny and the next day it's rainy. And that's the same with your mind. In your thoughts and feelings. But if you ruminate 10 hours a day, you will, this self-regulation will not be possible and you will, uh, you will prolong these states of mind. So you will, like a bad day will be prolonged to depression if you chew on the thoughts 10 hours a day, if you um, dwell on them, then the bad day will eventually become a depression. It's like putting gasoline on a, on a fire. You, it will never go out. It can become chronic if you keep on ruminating 10 hours a day on your negative thoughts and feelings. So in CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, there's the idea of negative core beliefs, which is essentially these beliefs that people might have about themselves or the world that can promote or sustain mental illness. Like, for example, someone believes that they're worthless or if someone believes that everybody hates them or things like things like this. And it, it seems to me that I wonder if you agree with this, but it seems like metacognitive therapy you could maybe view it as focused on certain negative core beliefs and, and sort of claiming that there are certain negative core beliefs that are the ones that actually matter, which are beliefs about belief. I'm wondering, do you accept that framing? What you think about yourself doesn't really matter because that changes from day to day. So your, the view of yourself, and, and I mean, if you don't uh, worry or ruminate so much and have internal focus, your view on yourself will, will, be, will uh, yeah, change by itself. And I actually, we, we actually did the study in my, when my PhD, I did my PhD, and, and the interesting, most interesting finding to me was actually that the core beliefs, the schemas, were more changed in metacognitive therapy than in CBT. And that really surprised me because in CBT, just very shortly, my, my PhD was a randomized trial. Half the people got CBT and half the people got MCT, metacognitive therapy. 
and uh, and then we we evaluated the effect on different uh, on different assessment f- uh, forms like um, core beliefs about yourself, the cognitive forms, but also metacognitive th- forms about the metacognitive beliefs. But the most interesting finding was that if you change the meta beliefs, the metacognitive beliefs, your core view on yourself changes more. <laughs> than when you actually work on the core beliefs like you do in CBT. And that really surprised me. The most interesting finding in my PhD was actually that the core beliefs, beliefs about yourself changed more when you, when you worked on the meta level and when your metacognitive beliefs. So when you change the metacognitive beliefs about uncontrollability and usefulness, then your core beliefs about yourself changed more in the positive direction than when you got CBT. And that was really interesting because CBT actually focuses on your core beliefs and that didn't change as much as just working on the metacognitive level. That really surprised me and, and of course, also my, my supervisor. Yeah, that's really interesting. What did you expect to find in the study? Were you just, did you expect to find that they would be sort of equally good or you know, what was your anticipation? Well, my hypothesis was equally good because that's like the null hypothesis, but, but there were some single case trials uh, with four depressed, chronically depressed patients who got really b- much better in metacognitive therapy. So we had some pilot data, you know, very promising pilot data, but none of us knew, you know, how good it was, the metacognitive therapy was compared to CBT and cognitive therapy. So 50% was uh, recovered in cognitive therapy, but it was 74% in metacognitive therapy, which is the highest level of recovery uh, when, it, when it comes to depression ever reported in any trial, really. It was 80 in each group, 70, 80 people in each group. So it was, it was very, very well powered. It's really good. Could you tell us about the protocol? So suppose that I were to go do magnetic cognitive therapy. What are, what are the sort of the different steps the therapist is taking me through? So when you came to therapy with me, I would first ask about a critical situation in your life where you have a negative thought or a catastrophe thought. So whenever you have a negative thought, what would be the first one? We call it the trigger thought. So it'd be anything from, you know, oh my God, what if I get cancer or a negative thought? Oh, I don't, I'm not good enough or whatever. Um, and then the most important question would be, what do you do with that thought? Do you leave it alone or do you work on the thought somehow? That would be the, the most important question. What do you do with the thought? Uh, yeah. So I could ask you, what, what do you normally do with negative thought? If you have a negative thought? Yeah, so maybe let's just do a real example. So if you don't mind. So if, for my own life, I, one thing I tend to worry about is work projects. I tend to, throughout the day, you know, I might have a thought about a work project pop into my mind. And I might say, oh, no, what if we don't get that thing done on time? Or what if you know, the implementation of that part doesn't, doesn't go well or something like that, right? Yeah. And do you just leave that what if alone or do you kind of plan what to do if that what if happens? So do you go into planning mode and then I will do that and what if that happens and I will do that? So like a planning mode? No, I think I do tend to go into a kind of planning mode, like thinking more about that project, thinking about well, what would happen if, you know, it didn't go well, you know, stuff like that. So that would be the, the thinking, that would be the, we call it the cognitive attentional syndrome, which is the, if you do that too much, then you'll have symptoms, stress, anxiety, bad sleep, and so on, insomnia. So, so I would ask, so how much time do you spend? I mean, is this just two minutes? Or would you spend the whole evening, the whole day doing this what if planning? Um, so how much time would you spend on that? That would be the next question. Right. And I think for, in my particular case, I think what happens is I might spend, you know, a couple of minutes thinking it through, but then I'll be on to the next thing, you know, like I'll, I'll be, go back to work or whatever, but that, that might happen many, many times a day. So there may be many instances of, yeah. So, I mean, so, that, that in, in itself is not a problem. So worrying, we all do that, but then you have the metacognitive beliefs and they are important. So, so that would be the next question. So do you believe it's, it's possible to control? So could you, you know, do it more, do it less? Is it, I mean, is it possible, you know, one day to do it to 10 hours and the next day to do not do it at all. I mean, can you ca- kind of self, I said, under your control, how much time you spend doing this process? So if you wanted to, could you leave the, this alone? If you, if you like, I say, I gave you a uh, hundred thousand, uh, over a hundred dollars. Could you then leave it alone if you wanted to one day? Yeah, it's really interesting because I feel like I can't control the thought popping into my head. Like, what if this thing goes wrong? But I, I feel like I could learn to say, to notice, okay, I just had that thought. And then not stick with it. Exactly. Very, very good observation. Yeah. Yes, it's a, that's a really good point because no one can control the popping up. The trigger thought is uncontrollable. That's completely right. But what you can learn, and that's what we actually focus on in metaconscious therapy, is your reaction, your, your answer to the trigger thought, not the trigger thought itself. So the 
answering part. And that's actually, not many people know this, but that can be, that is controllable if you answer it or not, if you leave it alone. So, um, yeah, that's the uncontrollability piece. Can you leave this thought alone? And, and then, then we will work on getting to a point where independent of what happens, you, you have a, a choice. You can leave it alone if you want to. Then I would ask you about usefulness. Do you think it's useful to spend 10 hours worrying and planning? And, or do you think you'd get the same success level if you only spend less time, maybe five minutes? Have you ever wondered if you have what it takes to be the founder or CEO of a successful startup? It takes a wide range of skills to run a successful business. Fortunately, Clearer Thinking has developed a quiz to help you determine if you have what it takes to start your own company. They've assembled the wisdom of some of the world's most experienced entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, gurus who have started multiple companies themselves or advised hundreds of companies. And that compiled wisdom includes information about the most important traits and skills that must be embodied in top entrepreneurs to achieve startup success. They then boiled all of that down into a simple quiz that you can take for free. Take the quiz to find out how well your personality and skills are suited to founding a startup, how much you know about starting a successful company, which famous startup CEO you're most like, what your greatest strengths and weaknesses are, what to look for in a co-founder, and what areas you could work on to improve your chance of success. To find the Entrepreneur Test, along with many other tools and mini courses, go to clearerthinking.org. So I'm curious about the idea of worry being helpful or unhelpful. Um, it seems to me, and I, I wonder if you agree with this or not, but it seems that some worry is helpful. Right? If, you, if there really is something that could go horribly wrong and you realize it, spending some time thinking about that thing can be beneficial, but that people who have mental health challenges often go way overboard. They do way more worrying than is actually productive. So I'm curious to hear, to hear how you think about the distinction between useful worrying and unuseful worrying. Well, it's very interesting because I don't think worrying is actually useful at all because how do you know, I'll read my favorite question, how do you know that you worry about the right things? How do you know you spend time on the right worries? <laughs> can you know that? I, I don't think you can know for sure that you're worrying about the right thing, but um, surely some of the things people worry about, there's actually something that they can do to help reduce the chance of something bad happening, right? Like, let's suppose you get in a fight with your partner and then the next day you're like thinking about it and you realize, you know, that my partner seemed really upset at me. You know, maybe there is something to think about there to figure out what you could have done differently or what you could do now to make up to your, for your partner. And just not, it doesn't seem to be like not thinking about it at all is the right answer. Maybe what you would say is that worrying is still not helpful, but maybe there's some other kind of thinking about it is helpful. I'm not sure. What's your perspective? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that the, this prolonged thinking in any way, because I, I, when I was young, I thought, you know, long-term uh, regret would help me become better and make less mistakes and so on. But long-term regret won't help you. So it's, it's about timing, of course. So maybe two minutes is okay to kind of reflect, what did I do? What did she say? But, but more than that won't really get you more close to uh, solutions and so on. And that's what people also say. They, I mean, they, they just spin around in their head and they don't get closer to solutions overthinking. So it's yeah, a little bit, it's quite be good. We have this concept called worry time or rumination time where you have like 15 minutes a day where you could do these things and then you can leave it alone the rest of the time. Right. So then the idea would be if you start notice yourself having worries or not during your kind of devoted worry time, you think, okay, this is not worry time. I'm going to, I'll push this till tomorrow or, you know, uh, I'm not supposed to do it now. Is that the idea? Exactly. Exactly. But that, but that of course, it's important. You, you feel the control to actually do that. To do this task, it's important that you feel it's, I mean, so it's like, yeah, so this would be an experiment, a behavioral experiment. Would it be possible for you to wait until 8 o'clock? And then people try it out and they realize, I could wait until 8. So it's like an uncontrollability experiment. And then they kind of, you know, believe more and more that, that this worry process is under their control. And that's what medical comes to therapy is about. My suspicion is that there are different things that we do that we might call worry. And some of them are useful and some not so useful. For example, let's let's go back to the example where say you have a fight with your partner and it kind of went badly and the next day you're thinking about it. It seems to me that there might be a useful exercise to do around that. It may take more than two minutes. Maybe it takes 10 minutes. Maybe it takes 15 minutes where you're kind of analyzing carefully like, okay, what was my contribution to the problem? What could I have done better? What was their contribution? What could they have done better? And what you're making a plan for what you want to do going forward. And so that like that kind of procedure seems useful to me, but that might differ from what most people are doing, right? 
Well, not not really, not really. I think that the main difference between you and the people who become, you know, depressed or anxious, it's the metacognitive beliefs. So you, so even if you a happy warrior, we call them happy warriors, and I think you, you sound like a happy warrior, and that's someone who who only has the usefulness belief. That if you only have the positive beliefs about the usefulness, you won't get a mental illness. It needs the negative beliefs. You need the uncontrollability belief and the danger belief if you really want to become. Uh, depressed or anxious so it's it's all about the negative metacognitive beliefs so if you are a happy warrior who only have the positive beliefs like it sounds like you have it's useful in some extent it's good you need to analyze i mean then you then you won't uh, become depressed because you only have the positive metacognitive beliefs but it takes the negative metacognitive beliefs the uncontrollability and the worry is dangerous it's going to make me stressed and give me a heart attack it takes those beliefs and they they are the beliefs that differs from, I mean, that, that's why you don't get anxious, because you still worry, you still analyze, you still ruminate, but the, you're, you only have the positive metacognitive beliefs about the process. Just to clarify, I do feel like I, I stress myself out needlessly. <laughs> I don't think, yeah, so I, I don't want to say that like I'm not excessively worrying. I do, I do think I am a worrier type personality, and I think I worry more than I ideally would. And, and it causes stress for myself. So I just want to clarify that. I think on the margin, I would be better wearing less. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So could you yeah. do that? I mean, I, could you yeah. easily do that if you wanted to? Could you could you make that choice easily I, and say, well, I'll do it less? I think for me, the challenge is that is catching it when it's happening, right? So if I notice, like if a worried thought comes up and I notice, oh, wait, I'm you know having a worried thought now, I, I feel like it's pretty easy to just kind of let that thought go. It's like, I don't get too stuck in it. But the problem is like, that's happening to me many times a day. And so it's sort of like, you're just get, you're getting so many things thrown at you and it's hard to notice, oh wait, I'm worrying now. So I'm curious, do you have exercises you use to help make people increase that awareness of like, oh wait, I'm starting to worry now and catch themselves in that moment? Well, worry is useful. I mean, that's two, that's two different main processes. The worry is more the future oriented where what if, what if, what if. And that's usually not unconscious. I mean, that's, you, you, you notice straight away because you get symptoms like heartbeat and so on. So worry is usually very, um, you, you, you're aware of it straight away, usually, that now I'm worrying. It's more the rumination that is like slowly moving into you and you can maybe ruminate for four hours before you actually realize, oh, I've been ruminating for four hours, you know, the, the past oriented, the dwelling, the what, what, why did I do that? So there's two, I mean, the why did this happen? Why am I feeling like this? Uh, and that is more... Uh, not very conscious that can be you know the unconscious the rumination is so that we have some exercises like attention training and so on that will increase your awareness but the worry process the what if process that's usually not very you're not unaware of that because it gives you physical symptoms and you know you're doing it when you're doing it usually so just to clarify is the distinction you're drawing between rumination and worry is just that rumination is about the past and worry is about the future or is there other differences there yeah, the difference is rumination, the, the, the function is finding solutions. So why is this happening? Why should I, what, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel so depressed? So it's more like why or what should I do? How should I solve this problem? Uh, whereas the worry process, the, the function is more to be prepared and to kind of, you know, prepare yourself to different future scenarios. So there's different functions and goals in the two processes. And that is, the difference is also how aware you are. You know, because the rumination is usually you're not very aware of it. So if I have a, a depressed person, they don't say, I'm a ruminator. They never say that. So if I ask them, what's your problem? They say, I feel low, I feel low mood and so on. And if I ask them, how much time do you spend ruminating? They'll usually say, I don't spend any time. I just feel low. And they have very low awareness about the rumination. They just don't notice they're doing it. They, 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 would, they would never say, I'm a ruminator. Whereas the anxious people, the, the people with anxiety, they would usually say, I worry too much. I'm a worrier. I worry all the time. So they have much more awareness of this worry process than the depressed people have. So that's just to, you know, differentiate a bit there. I see. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So maybe we should talk about some specific problems people suffer from and, and then how um, metacognitive therapy addresses them. So maybe let's talk about low self-esteem. How does that kind of come up in metacognitive therapy and, and how would you work with someone who has that? Yeah, that's very interesting because that's the, the core beliefs we started off talking about. And we see them as not as stable like we do in, in cognitive therapy. So in CBT, cognitive therapy, you see them as like stable internal, you know, beliefs about yourself, the world and, and so on. But we don't see them as stable in metacognitive therapy. They are self-regulatory. So they will change uh, towards 
you know, through your life or even from day to day. So your self-esteem will, will, the one day will be good. I feel good about myself, but then the next day you'll feel bad about yourself. And if you don't do anything with that feeling, it will self-regulate. So you'll have like an unstable self-esteem. And that's the normal self-esteem. It's the, the unstable one. The, you know, one day I feel good about myself and the next day I don't. But if you ruminate a lot and, and uh, work a lot on your self-esteem, and that's a paradox. <laughs> so if you work on solving your self-esteem, you will actually prolong the low self-esteem. And that's the paradox in it. So I have a lot of people who have a chronic low self-esteem and they've been doing loads of things to you know, feel better about themselves. So they would do like diaries where they put positive events in the diary or try to talk to themselves, you know, you're good enough, you're good enough, you're good enough, and so on. And um, they'll spend many, many hours a day trying to change their low self-esteem. And it hasn't worked. You know, they come to Metacom to therapy and say, well, I still feel bad about myself. And all these working on it and thinking positive and trying to think positive and so on, it just made, made me really... Uh, tired uh, and exhausted and hasn't changed my self-esteem. So then we start saying, well, would you be willing for the next week, the next six weeks to do something else and see what happens? And most people are willing because I tried everything else. So we then invite them to leave it alone, the, the lazy uh, approach, the detached mindfulness, which is the opposite of working on a thought. And detached mindfulness is not being thoughtless or emotionless. It's just about not working on the thoughts and emotions. So uh, like the fish hook or the train metaphor, you have you have the the fish hooks, you have the train, but you don't do you don't do anything with it. And then they they usually say, well, I'll try it, try it out. And then you, whenever they feel bad about themselves, they practice leaving it alone or postponing or ruminating about it. And then they they realize, well, it was uh, you know changing by itself. So if they don't work on the self-esteem, they will naturally feel good about themselves one day, some of the days and have a normal self-esteem. That's the, the meta comes away. The way you describe this reminds me a little bit of acceptance and commitments ther therapy, also known as ACT, where you take the thoughts that you're having and you kind of, uh, as, as far as I understand it, in ACT, you view them sort of from an outside perspective. Uh, you know, one metaphor is like you treat your thoughts like they're just leaves floating by on a stream, right? It's like, oh, I had the thought that I'm a shitty person and I had the thought that I have cancer and you kind of just observe the thoughts, let them float away. A very kind of mindfulness-based approach. And I'm wondering how you, how that relates to the metacognitive therapy approach. Mm, well, some of the metaphors you've just described there, some of the, it gives the people idea that it will float away. It'll, it'll like, uh, you know, move on. <laughs> and we don't, um, we don't actually have these, I mean, it, it it, I mean, in mesocognitive therapy, the goal is not for thoughts to move on or to, it's, um, we, need, we leave them alone. So they, they might stay, you know, the, they might not float on or, you know, the, the, the clouds might not move on, the clouds might stay there. So we don't give people any um, promises of, you know, thoughts and feelings disappearing necessarily, but it might, they might do. And that's the, the secondary bonus that they are. But, but uh, the, the metaphors and mesocognitive therapy are more like, well, can you leave it at like the fish hooks, for example, leave it alone or the chewing gum. Can you have a chewing gum in your mouth and not chew on it? So, so the thoughts are still there. They're not like floating on. <laughs> they're not moving on necessarily. Can you still leave them alone, even if they're not moving on? So I don't know. I, I think they call it diffusion in, ex in acceptance and commitment. We call it detached mindfulness to leave some, something alone, to leave thoughts alone. Yeah. I see. And I'm curious, even though the goal is not to have people have fewer thoughts per se, do you find that when people go through these exercises and they change their beliefs about worry, that they start having fewer worry thoughts? Or do you think that they tend to have the same number? They just engage with them very differently. It's a little bit different, I would say. So, so um, not many people say, oh, I actually have few of them. You know, I'm more clear in my head. If I don't ruminate so much or worry so much, my, my head becomes clearer and they have fewer trigger thoughts. That's some people say that, but not all. But we don't really go for that goal. The most important goal is the metacognitive beliefs are changed. That independent, if my brain is, you know, very active and I have a lot of thoughts, or if I don't have, I can, you know, no matter what, what the day is like or if it's night or day, I can choose to leave it alone. That's what we do. That's what the main goal. Another thing that I think confuses me a little bit about your approach is that some problems arise from things in the world, right? So take, for example, someone who's in an abusive relationship. And, you know, they come to your office and they're worrying all the time, but, but let's say their partner is really treating them horribly and beating them up and all the kinds of things, right? So 
I would imagine in such a case that problem solving would be the first thing to try. Be like, okay, how do we help this person get to a safe situation? Whereas working at the level of their belief or, or level of their like beliefs about their worry or beliefs about their thoughts may not be as effective. So I'm curious to hear your reaction to that kind of situation. Well, I would say the opposite. And in the old days, when I was a CBT therapist, I actually would work on that level, the problem solving level. And it's very interesting. I actually had a case like that recently in metacognitive therapy. And if she would have come into my clinic, you know, 15 years ago, I would have problem solved. But it was so interesting what happened when I, when I, when I removed her 10 hours of ruminating. Uh, and she, I mean, just very, very quickly, she, she had um, an abusive relationship. She was beat up a, a lot and so on. But apart from that, she also ruminated and worried a lot. So she would have a lot of dilemma rumination. What should I do? Should I stay? Should I go? Uh, why is he doing this? Could I could I do something to prevent it? And he promised and blah, blah, blah. So she would, apart from, I mean, she was maybe maybe a, a hit maybe two or two times a day. But but all the thinking actually lasted 10 hours a day. But I did metacognitive therapy with her and started, you know, would you kind of leave the thoughts alone and go from 10 hours a day thinking to maybe half an hour a day? And I was amazed what happened to her because when she do, did that, she got much more energy. She got her self-esteem came back and she actually had the, the clarity, her, her mind became clearer. So she could actually find out what she wanted to do. She, she could feel what I want this and she could actually have the energy to go on the Internet and find an apartment and move away from this abusive um, partner and so on. So she could actually problem solve her life herself uh, when we removed all, all this overthinking she was also doing. And that's really amazed me how, you know, how people become much more powerful when they, when they don't have this backpack of thinking uh, on them as well. So I would never go back to problem solving. I would always, you know, t- remove the cast, as we call it, the cognitive behavioral syndrome, all this overthinking, remove that and then see what's, what's left. I mean, maybe, and, and it's so rare that, that you need to work on anything else, really. I'm, I'm really surprised. And I also had a couple actually the other day and, and I thought, okay, I really when I when I removed all this overthinking, and they only argue from eight to eight thirty at night every night because they argued ten hours a day. And we go, you know, I thought after that we need to work on their communication because they had really really poor communication. And I thought that's going to be the next step, but we didn't get there because when they left, when they left the thoughts alone, and they only argued from eight to eight thirty, they could talk to each other really well and. Um, you know, that communication was really good when they didn't uh, talk about their thoughts in the heat of the moment. Yeah, I can certainly see how if people are spending a ton of time ruminating or worrying, it can kind of sap their energy and it can give them lack of clarity. But it seems like at least sometimes people actually just genuinely don't know what to do. And they like they don't know how to solve a problem in their world. And, it's, you know, so I, I you should, but it seems like you think that like sort of you should never help someone problem solve pretty much. Is that right? Well, uh, I must. I, I would like. To, I mean, I, I, I always say to myself, "Okay, let's let's remove the cast, and then I would go to problem solving." But but amazingly, it's very rare that people want that when, because when we remove this overthinking, people have no depression, no anxiety, they have more energy. I, I mean, it's so rare. I can't think of last time that someone we ended up problem solving because they actually, you know, they got a different job or they 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 just uh, changed their environment themselves um and they weren't you know bound by all this thing i mean it, it's, i can't think of last time i i, I ended up <laughs> problem solving afterwards but of course one time has to be the first so um yeah it might happen mm-hmm. one day and i i would i would be open to that but maybe it's not problem solving that's i mean maybe people don't lack the the problem solving skills maybe it's the overthinking that is inhibiting them from from accessing this problem-solving ability that they maybe have already. Do you have an idea for a digital product that could improve the world? Are you frustrated by cookie-cutter survey platforms that don't give you the level of personalization you need for your research content? GuidedTrack might be what you're looking for. GuidedTrack will empower you to effortlessly create and launch apps, surveys, educational modules, prototypes, and online tools, even if you have no programming experience. From Ayla's famous kink survey to the quiz called Can You Guess Which Studies Replicate, made by 80,000 Hours, GuidedTrack's easy-to-use platform and flexible interface has enabled some of the most creative people and organizations to bring their impactful ideas to life. In fact, it's what we've used to build all 70 of Clearer Thinking's interactive digital tools. To make it even easier for you to embark on your next project, we've recently launched 10 free templates. Simply choose the template that aligns best with your goals and customize the content as needed. But you want to know what the best part is? 
GuidedTrack is completely free to use. So visit guidedtrack.com to sign up for your free account and start making your next big thing. Let's talk about the belief side of this too, because you know, an example I've seen in my own life is where someone seems to genuinely believe that they're worthless. And if, you, if someone believes they're worthless, it's very natural to see why they might feel unhappy all the time. But it sounds like somehow, from your point of view, somehow their, their rumination is actually like, is like keeping this belief in place. So maybe you could just unpack a little bit more. How is it that stopping the rumination like, like frees up this belief to change? Because it, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't, that connection doesn't seem totally obvious to me. Well, well, now usually I would say, I'll normalize the feeling. I'll say, well, I feel shitty sometimes too. I also feel like I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. I'm, I'm a hopeless person. That's normal human feeling. We all feel that once in a while. And that's surprised to many, really a surprise. Really? Is that possible? To, I mean, do other people have that uh, belief once in a while? Because we all feel like bad people once in a while or bad you know, parents or whatever. We, we all feel bad about ourselves. It's very normal. And then the next question would be, so when you have that feeling, like it's a human, natural human feeling, what do you do with it? I mean, what have you done today with it? And then you always find this uh, working on, on the thought. Uh, so people would say different things, uh, like I'll try to push the feeling away. I would uh, try to calm myself. You know, I would ask someone, am I good enough you know, to seek reassurance? So people do different things to this, uh, this belief. And it's all this doing that, uh, you know, actually all the problem solving that is maintaining the problem somehow. So, um, yeah, and, when, and then the next question would be, have you ever tried for a week maybe not to problem solve this feeling of not being a good person or a bad person? Just be with it. It's there, but you don't work on it. I, I use a metaphor like, can you look at the, uh, the, the dishes that are not, can you just watch the dishes without taking them, without doing them? <laughs> like the same way, you know, you watch the feeling, it's there, you feel you're not, you're not good enough, you're a bad person. But for a week, you do nothing with it. You just take it around. You take it to wherever you go. You just leave it alone. They never tried that. So that would be an experiment in itself. And then we, uh, we test what happens. And then people come back after a week maybe and say, well, it actually, you know, I feel lighter, more energy. It might not have completely changed. Maybe they still feel bad about themselves, but they, they have more, uh, they are more present in the moment. They are more, more energy and so on. And some people actually also say, well, some days it, I forgot about this feeling because I was so absorbed about other things in the real life so that I really forgot about the feeling about being a shitty person, a bad person. What about a problem like insomnia? Could you tell us how, how you'd apply metacognitive therapy there? Yeah, that's the same again. <laughs> when, when people have two nights of bad sleep, which is normal too, I have many nights I have a little baby. <laughs> so many nights of bad sleep. But even before the baby, I also have bad nights because it's a human normal human condition that some nights you, you sleep like a baby, like nine, nine hours of perfect sleep. And some, some nights you don't sleep and some nights you wake up all the time. So the normal sleep is not a perfect sleep. The normal sleep is very interchangeable. So, uh, but what happens after two bad nights is that you become desperate because when you have two bad nights where you don't sleep, you think, oh my God, I have to sleep tonight because I'm not functioning. My mind is completely murdered and I can't focus. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a bad version of myself and so on. So you really become desperate. And then you might Google how, what to do when you have bad sleep. And that's the worst you can do because then you get a lot of strategies and tools that you can spend. Maybe, I mean, I, I find when, when I ask people how much time do you spend problem solving your sleeping, they would spend, you know, they would start maybe two o'clock in the afternoon and start okay, now I have to think about how to get a good sleep and I have to get the, the windows down and I have to have positive thinking in my head and I have to have my mindfulness meditation on. And, and they really, they, they try to optimize the sleep. And so they think that metacognitive therapy is just one more tool for the toolbox. But I have to kind of disappoint them a bit and ask, well, have you ever tried to throw away the toolbox and see what happens to your sleep? So because in metacognitive therapy, less is more, right? So the, 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 here, the, the problem solving is actually maintaining the problem. So you would get chronic insomnia if you keep on doing 10 hours of problem solving on your sleep every day. So you throw away the, the toolbox in metacognitive therapy and uh, do nothing with it. And then it will self-regulate. So you'll have good nights, bad nights, good nights, bad nights, and so on. I, I've definitely had the experience where I'm like, oh, man, I have an important presentation in the morning. I really have to sleep tonight. And that makes it so much harder to sleep well. It's just like way too aware. So yeah. The best strategy is the detached mindfulness again. 
where you are lazy. And you might be eight hours of lazy, but you might be lucky to fall asleep. But even the worst case, you're just eight hours of lazy. And that's better than eight hours of working on sleeping. You know what I mean? Uh, so you need to just be lazy and hope for sleep or, yeah, worst case, just be eight hours, hours of lazy uh, where you, you know, just lie there and do nothing. Do as little as possible with, it, with your thoughts and feelings. So let's talk about the, the state of the evidence for metacognitive therapy. So I know that your PhD thesis, you, you ran a randomized control trial. What other work has been done pitting it against a control group or pitting it against other techniques? Mm, well, at the moment, the, the, the large uh, diagnosis like GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, PTSD, as post-traumatic stress, depression, and so they, they have had large trials, both with control groups and uh, CBT. And the generalized anxiety trial, where they compared CBT um, to MCT, they actually had a nine-year follow-up, which is really unusual. It's very incredible to have a nine-year follow-up, which is amazing. Uh, and after nine years, it was still over 60% who, had, who were diagnosis-free in the metacognitive therapy and just over 30 in cognitive therapy. So that's really good uh, because we wait this many years after the trial. Have there been any meta-analyses done yeah, so there's two uh, large, I think the last one is from 20, 2021. So there, there are a couple of years ago, um, and there was one from 19, I was 18. Yeah, and, and it's, it, again, it, showed, it seems promising and it seems to be better than CBT, but of course we need more large, large, powerful trials comparing, you know, we need a lot of more trials, like comparing cool kids for children to metacognitive therapy for children and so on. There's a lot of trials that need to be done, which is at the beginning. But for the big diagnosis like depression, generalized anxiety, uh, OCD, obsessional thinking, PTSD, and so on, there's there's some pretty good trials with comparing both, you know, waitlist and um, and uh, CBT, showing that metacognitive therapy is superior. So before we wrap up, I just want to give the listeners opportunity to think about how they could apply these ideas in their own life. So. Let's say someone wants to kind of just do some exper self experiments and just kind of explore these ideas on their own. Yeah, what are some what are some things you'd recommend they try? Well, the, one of the easy things to start off is, is is this rumination time. You know, where you set up a time during the day it could be five to five thirty, where you try to have your your problem solving, your worrying, and if you if the if a worry pops up in your head, like if a trigger thought pops up, let's like say in the in the morning. Then you instruct yourself to leave it alone. And if it's still important at five o'clock, then you can work on it there. So this is kind of an experiment. Can I wait and can I wait till five o'clock? And you, it's not mandatory. So if you don't want to worry at five o'clock, you don't, you don't need to worry. If you don't have to worry, you can just wait until the next day. But then you, you can try to try out if it's possible to ma you know, manipulate what you do with those trigger thoughts and maybe wait to chew on them. And that would be the first step to both increase your uncontrollability belief, like, you know, that you think more, that you can actually leave it alone. Um, and also you might find life goes on, you don't make more mistakes, everything's good, even though you, you limit the time you spend worrying and ruminating. So your usefulness belief will also be, be changed a bit. With, re with regard to that, do people, when they have worries or ruminations outside of the worry time, do they write them down so that they can review them? So during the worry time, they have a list of them? Or do they just say, no, I'll just remember during the worry time. You don't need to, to do things with your thoughts and just list them. If your, your brain will, will still, you know, it'll still be there if it's important enough. Otherwise, it wasn't, wouldn't be important. Got it. Okay, excellent. So that's a, that's a great, really concrete suggestion. Any other kind of concrete things you'd suggest people to try as an experiment? Practice being together with negative thoughts and feelings without doing anything with them. That's a good practice. And, and could you elaborate a little more on like what that looks like to not do anything with it? Is it mean just sort of, Go think about something else. Does it mean it's just mm -hmm. being lazy? So you 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 don't have to you know move your attention really. You just you just uh, you know it's there, but you don't do anything with it. It's like the fishes again. <laughs> it's there, you know, but you don't do anything with it. You right. just you feel it's there, like a mosquito bite. You feel it's itchy and it's there, but you don't you don't scratch it. Got it. Right. So so it's like if I had the thought, oh no, what if we don't meet this deadline? Right. The next thing would just be just sort of stop that pr process, but if there's nothing in particular I need to do, just say, okay. Exactly, and then, and then yeah, you yeah. see, and then you'll, 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 the day after, it'll be self-regulate. It'll self-regulate. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, it, and it's, it's a, um, I find it especially interesting how it contrasts with the cognitive behavioral therapy approach, where cognitive ther behavioral therapy says, no, you want to engage with that thought. You want to sort of 
Maybe you consider the evidence for that, whether that thought is true or not. Maybe you rewrite the thought and to you know, try to come up with a more helpful version. And this is saying, it's like almost the complete opposite. It's like, nope, just stop right there. You don't need, you don't need to engage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the complete opposite yeah. of CBT. Yeah, it is. And, it, and it's, it's, that's why it's a paradigm shift. It's a, the opposite approach than, than most other therapies, including CBT. Because in other therapies, you spend time working on thoughts, changing thoughts, changing emotions. Uh, so it's the opposite of most therapies. Fantastic. Pia, um, any last things you want to say to the listeners? Just uh, hope that people will get interested in metacognitive therapy. There's not that many uh, in the United States, unfortunately. Uh, but I can send a list of um, where, because you need to have a proper educated metacognitive therapy. It's not enough to just listen to a podcast and then you can do metacognitive therapy. So if you want someone who's been trained with Adrian Wells, Professor Adrian Wells, who developed the therapy, you want to find uh, the person on a certified list um, of these. Yeah, and uh, I can send you the, the list of these different around the world, people who have been trained with him. Fantastic. Yeah, we can uh, add that to the show notes. Pia, thanks so much for coming on. This was a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by We Amplify. Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. If you like our show, then we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. To sign up for that newsletter or to find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit podcast.clearerthinking.org. A listener asks, what are the most important problems psychologists should be working on? So I actually have a spreadsheet of what I think are some of the most important topics in psychology. And part of the reason I'm excited about psychology, I just think there's so many important topics that it could potentially make progress on. Everything from how do humans be happy? How do people live more fulfilling lives? How do people get along with each other better? How do we avoid conflict? Or how do we even avoid you know, extreme conflict like genocide? How do we improve our decision making? How do we reduce our biases? How do we improve mental health, right? So there's just so many of these different topics that are really, really essential to the flourishing of society and individuals that I think psychology, in theory at least, is the right field to make progress on these.